Imagine if Charles Darwin had had access to a spaceship to travel around our galaxy and collect samples. What would such an intergalactic beagle accomplish? That's what Eric Kirschenbaum's fascinating new book, The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy, reveals. One of the most brilliant zoologists of our time takes us on a journey through our galaxy and what it means to be conscious, to be a life form, and the prospects for what that will teach us about life on Earth. He's a delightful individual and you're gonna love this book. It's the book that Darwin wished he could have written way back in the early 1800s when he first set sail aboard the HMS Beagle. Come along with a modern day Darwin as we explore the galaxy and all the wonderful creatures that may await us. Come along, let's go into the impossible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it is a great pleasure to have on Professor Art Kirschenbaum of Cambridge University, all the way across the pond. And here we have uh, some simulated British weather because it's actually not 72 degrees and sunny in San Diego today. It's pouring and about uh, 55 degrees. So winter is finally here in, in um, early March. Uh, how are you, Eric? It's great. Yeah, we're, we're doing great here. Maybe winter's not even close to being over, actually. <laughs> What can you do? It's a great treat to have you on the podcast. You're a fan favorite. I've wanted to have you on for years. And now on the occasion of the paperback book uh, launch of The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy, I thought it was an opportune time to chat with you. And I think this book uh, dovetails nicely with some themes that are percolating in the, in the metaverse, in the, in, our, in, the, in the universe of ideas, in the zeitgeist, however you want to call it, uh, about alien life and what it might be like and what it might teach us about life on Earth. Uh, but before we do that, um, we always like to do the thing you're never supposed to do as a reader. But what else can you do? You don't have any. You talk a lot in the book about game theory. Well, how how do you apprise whether you should read this book or watch a cat video? Um, and so I want to ask you, and we're going to play my favorite game, and it's called judging books by their covers. Uh, what is the uh, genesis, uh, if you will, to use a very loaded phrase uh, with with good reason, as you'll see? What is genesis of the title, of the subtitle, and the cover art of your wonderful new book? Yeah, well, it, it's it is interesting because it's a, it's an unusual book. You don't see a lot of books that 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 combine questions like life in the universe with life on Earth. So. Um, it wasn't a particularly easy sell, so uh, a lot of a lot of publishers were reluctant to go anywhere near a scientific examination of, of extraterrestrial life. And 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 really, I, I actually, uh, when I first conceived the book, I really wanted to write a book more about about life on Earth, uh, and maybe with a little bit of, of 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 aliens here and there, just to just to give a nice comparison. And um, and most publishers were like, you know what, ditch the aliens. Uh, the, the, Write, write a book about animals, ditch the aliens. Uh, and then my, I'm very lucky that the publisher I ended up with, they said, well, we like the idea, but can you beef up the aliens a bit um, and have more aliens in there? Um, so that's, that is really why it, it got the emphasis, um, the emphasis that it did. But it's, it's a blend of those two questions. And this, that's where the subtitle fits in really nicely, because this is a book about the laws governing alien, uh, the, the nature of alien life, but it's a book about the laws governing life, and therefore it's a book about us. It's a book about life on Earth. It's a book about the diversity of life on Earth, where it came from, um, and 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 where we came from, and and what our nature is. So so in in it really is that that blend between between the two, and 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 I I think that worked out nicely. I like yeah. that. It was very reminiscent, you know, not to, to, you know, damn it with high praise, but it reminded me of, you know, what I know about Darwin's, you know, Voyage of the Beagle. It was very reminiscent of this, you know, kind of journey, obviously, of uh, sort of this hero's journey <clears throat> that uh, that Darwin took. But you take more of an, an intellectual rather than, you know, you're not actually journeying, you know, spoiler alert, to other gal uh, other parts of the galaxy yet, Um but uh, but speaking of beagles, it looks like you're joined by some life forms in the background. Uh, I don't believe they're beagles, but uh, what, what, tell us about your your uh, collaborators there. 
<laughs> well, um, if you're referring to my dog Darwin, he's he's lying on the floor there and and, and groaning a little bit. He's 15 years old, so uh, so uh, he, he's entitled to groan and he's entitled <laughs> to sleep as well. Um, yes, I most teenage t- teenage boys will will take you up on that offer. Um, so, in that spirit, you know this this magical kind of journey that you take us along. Uh, and I'm not accompanied by any living forms, but I did bring a galaxy. You can see it in the back over there. There's uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy M51, uh, which is a uh, coalescing galaxy. And uh, I wanted to, you know, kind of really start with with a um, with a quote that you mentioned in the book uh, from the namesake of the organization that I'm p- pleased to be a co-director of, which is the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination here at UC San Diego. And you quote Sir Arthur, and you say, "Nowhere in space will we rest our eyes." upon the familiar shapes of trees and plants or any of the animals that share our world. Whatsoever life we meet will be as strange and alien as the nightmare creatures of the ocean abyss or of the insect empire whose horrors are normally hidden from us by their microscopic scales. Um, what, what, what about that quote really resonates with you? Is it, is it the you know, kind of disabuse of this notion that we're going to meet you know, entities with just bigger foreheads than us and and big eyes and gray skin what 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 about that quote resonates with you well it resonates with me for for its its errors as well as as for its uh, for its insight and you know if you look at the history of humans thinking about life on other planets we've gone through all these phases we've gone through phases of um, being convinced that 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 other other worlds have human like creatures on them and and through to this through to a great deal of skepticism um and really until the discovery of of exoplanets uh, 20 years ago skepticism dominated the idea of, of what we might know about about life on other planets and in that in that period in that period between certainty that there were angels on other worlds and um, a discovery that there might actually be life on uh, that we can discover on on other planets. A lot of a lot of poor ideas came into uh, consideration about of, of of alien life, and and the one that I like the best because I think it's a fantastic book in every respect other than than its um, consideration of biology was Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud. It's one of my favorite science fiction uh, books, and and it's really a tremendous read. Um, but it really typifies this idea that. Whatever's out there has got to be so completely different, so completely alien that we can't know anything about it, and that's just not true. I mean, that arises out of a, of a lack of understanding of what life is and where life comes from, and and the the case that I make, and and I hope I make it convincingly, is that there are rules, there are constraints, there are laws, um, there are things that that mean that while. Uh, we may not see trees like trees on Earth, but trees of some sort there will probably be. So I think I think that that quote by Arthur C. Clarke is nice because it 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 simultaneously gives the idea that don't let's think that that we're going to have alien uh, humans with with large foreheads. But at the other time, it it it, it just goes too far. We we've got to pull back a bit and and, and understand that that life is governed by rules. Do you think that um, along those lines, that because there's sort of this fixation that either aliens will be just like us in some sense, you know, have five kind of vast appendages or whatever, uh, uh, or, you know, will have some sort of symmetry properties or will be macroscopic, you know, on the kind of midway point between the Planck scale and the size of the universe in some sense. Um, Do you think that you know, with me, it resonates with this um, uh, quote from The Right Stuff, uh, the book by Thomas Wolfe about the astronaut program. And there was a quote in there, um, you know, that they said, we can't get money unless there are astronauts on these, uh, you know, I mean, obviously humans could do anything that John Glenn did, you know, go up in a, in a rock and come back down, or dogs did that. But their quote was, no buck, no buck Rogers, no bucks. Um, and, or maybe it was the other way around. But but the point being that you had a sort of appeal of pandering somewhat to the human interest aspect of things. And I think, especially with this resurgence of interest in alien, you know, craft coming here, I mean, what could be more like we are than some alien, you know, flying discs that, yeah, maybe they use different propulsion that we don't understand, but they're using crafts about the size of our airplanes and the inhabitants must be about the same size as us. Um, Do you think that that's, you know, fundamentally an anthropomorphic or anthropocentric 
um, vantage point that the, in contradistinction to the alien insects of Clark, that there's a whole other camp that says, no, they must be like us. And, and, and kind of in order to appeal to our desire and maybe funding and so forth. Well, there's, I think there are many things that are driving public perception of what alien life might be like. And look, Right, on, at the beginning, we've got to put it on the table. Any alien life that we discover in the next 50 years is going to be microbial or, or, or the equivalent. You know, we're not, we're not genuinely, I don't think that I will ever get the chance to you know, study alien animals in, in the way that I study animals on Earth. So, so I think that, that's a really a, a long way off. But in terms of the public perception of what aliens are like, um, you know, it, it's been driven a lot by our fear of humans. If you think about the flying saucers and the alien invasions, and you know this, this is all Cold War stuff. This is all um, this is all appealing to it to it to a public narrative uh, that has little to do with life on other planets, and and so it, it's best just to discard that. I think. I mean, it, it's it's one of the reasons that I don't subscribe to the whole the whole UFO idea. Is it, apart from any. Um, any sort of rational and, and scientific reasons, I, I just feel that it's that, that it seems to be a throwback to uh, to to the, the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, and 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 it, it's un- unconvincing to me. I, I'm much more interested in the fundamental scientific rules that might actually give us some idea about about what alien life forms might be like. Mm. You talked about the microbial probability just now, and it made me think of you know something that I've got on the record about, and maybe a little bit controversial. But I claim you know tomorrow we wake up and you know, let's do a Gnankin experiment. We wake up and you know some of my colleagues here. I've got a colleague, uh, you know Professor Shelley Wright. She does optical SETI. She does, but let's just say you know one of her colleagues and or her or whatever. They discover, you know, some byproduct of microbial life, or maybe this, um, you know, this meteorite that landed in Antarctica, where I've spent uh, two winters or two summers. I guess it was my su- their summer, my winter. Um, you know, they find oh, it actually is a microbial respiratory byproduct. Okay, um, I claim that excitement will last for a week. Um, and, and, uh, but almost no more. And I'm wondering, like, what do you think would be the reaction? Because I think we have already seen what happened. I mean, the, the, the meteorite that fell in the Allen Hills has never conclusively been falsified to not contain alien remnants. It was announced by president Bill Clinton on the white house front lawn in 1997, I believe 96. And, uh, it's never been refuted. So we already kind of have the answer to this Gedanken experiment. But what do you think? Do you think that it would fundamentally change our perspective of our place in, 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 uh, as, a, as a species in the, in the galaxy and in the universe? I, I totally agree with you. I think, it, I, I think it wouldn't. I don't think that the discovery of, of microbial alien life will, will hold the public imagination for, for very long, uh, but it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to, you know, it needs to, it, it, it is a scientific discovery and not a not a PR discovery. Um, the goal is not to, to create a media circus. The goal is to find out what's going on what's going on in the universe. And in the long term, of course, it will be hugely it will be hugely important. Look, we're dealing at the moment with huge existential threats to to humanity. We need to deal with our with our climate threat. Discovering uh, microbes in a in another solar system and it's not going to change that, and it's not going to make us. Um, come together and say, well, oh, we have to save life on this planet because there's life on other planets or something like that. But it's a fundamental shift in our science. It's a fundamental shift in our understanding of science. I, I'm not a historian, but I would be very surprised if when Copernicus declared that the earth goes around the sun, that people were running around in the streets screaming and, and, and you know, waving their arms about. I, I think that's unlikely, but it's still it still generated a shift in the way that science is done and the way that we understand the, 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 our observations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that is uh, that is true. And, and you make this beautiful statement, you know, that we are the first generation that cannot in human history that cannot say that there, you know, that Earth is unique among the types of planets that Earth is, the Earth-like planet. Uh, there's not just one Earth-like planet. And and similarly, it made me think back to, yeah, I mean, back when Giordano Bruno, uh, you know, was burned at the stake for claiming that stars were other suns, uh, he couldn't claim that. You know, he couldn't get away with that. Um, 
but uh, but we're living in a, in, a, in a completely new paradigm because of the discoveries of things like Kepler and others. And and I want to push back with respect, uh, not on you, but but on kind of this 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 feeling in the community of which you are one of the foremost kind of uh, expositors, which is that. Um, you know, life is abundant in the universe and that if it's not, it's kind of a waste of space. And I hear this a lot from my religious friends uh, who will say, you know, if there is no God, uh, then, you know, life is ultimately unjust and the universe is unjust uh, because why do the good um, get punished and the wicked thrive? And, and uh, you know, theodicy, the basic question of theodicy. I think there's a theodesic component uh, to, alien, you know, in other words, they have to exist because there's so much space. And again, you know, just hearkening from my experience in Antarctica, I saw like six penguins, you know, the whole time I've been there. I spent two months there almost, seen six penguins in my whole life, and I couldn't get close enough to one to bring it home for one of my kids. But uh, <laughs> uh, I would probably be shot on sight. Uh, but, you know, it's a capacious continent. You know, it's one seventh of all the continents on Earth. And yet there's almost no, you know, animal life there besides, you know, some some scuba birds and, and a couple of sea lions. And uh, But on the continent itself, almost nothing. It's, it's completely devoid of life. Um, even my, even microbial life is hard to find, but a lot of the people in the, uh, extraterrestrial life community claim that discoveries like Kepler, uh, those by Kepler satellite, those by, um, researchers on extremophiles. Another famous, you know, kind of, um, uh, event was about seven years ago, the discovery of this arsenic life. You'll recall that in, um, in Mono Lake here in, in, in California, beautiful place. And that turned out to be unverifiable. And yet it was a press release. It was an accepted paper in science uh, and so forth. So a lot of of the research that I hear, and I get criticism from my colleagues, why are you, SETI Institute people, why are you spending money researching extremophiles and researching, you know, uh, sociological language, as you talk about in the book a lot? Um, Is that not putting, you know, the the, the cart far, far ahead of the alien horse? (laughs) I mean, we have no evidence, I think, and you say this in the book, and it's not really a criticism of the book, but there's no evidence for life elsewhere. So, like, talking about second-order things like their culture and society, what do you say to somebody who criticizes that as being so far in advance of what, um, you know, what is justified by the evidence? Well, the, the, the appeal of thinking about aliens stimulates important discussions about life. If we want to know, if we're asking, so you ask quite rightly the, the question, why does why should all this space be filled? Um, well, why should this space be filled comes down to some very clear scientific questions that we can ask. How likely is abiogenesis? How likely is life to arise from non-life? If it's very likely to arise, um, then the answer to your question is yes, the space will be filled. Um, if it's very unlikely to arise, then 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 perhaps not. But but these are these are questions that that can be addressed scientifically. So so if we didn't think about alien life, we might not be asking those questions at all. Now, when it comes to the kinds of questions that I ask, which may seem even further into the future about about societies, about language, and 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 what kind of language would aliens have? You're quite right that these are not testable hypotheses. But they're the opportunity to ask important questions about the constraints on biological life, and they then have implications for us on Earth, which is hence the subtitle of the book, right? What what it tells about ourselves. Sometimes you cannot think about yourself without thinking about where your place is in, in, in the greater scheme of things. So as I said, I do not believe I will ever get to 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 watch alien animals and 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 you know and unless unless we're really lucky i mean what i'm praying for is that is that that some alien civilization somewhere has this david attenborough uh, sort of equivalent and they're beaming their nature documentaries to us so that's a possibility but no i don't i don't seriously hold out hope for seeing alien animals but by thinking about what they would be like if they do exist tells us a great deal about animal life on earth and how that arise arose and 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 where it's going yeah so um along those themes you know again i i i I, this book is is phenomenal in that it is evocative of this great you know magnificent work by darwin and the voyage of the beagle and and other and other works um and uh speaking of beagle your dog darwin seems pretty pretty content over there um what is it about zoologists you you guys um yeah i'm an astronomer so i'm on the a side of the alphabet you're a z uh, zoologist what is it about that 
um, profession? I mean, you've studied everything from coral to wolves. Uh, um, what made you pivot to aliens? Why, why that um, very dynamic pivot? Yeah, well, um, my field is is animal communication, so that's what I what I what I research. And um, I, th- one of the things that I do uh, is looking at where information is in animal calls. So, w- broadly speaking, you could ask, what do they mean? Um, but we need to drill down and, and and define that a little bit more rigorously. So let's let's talk very generally. What kind of information exists in an animal call when a bird sings? What information is it putting into its song? When a wolf howls, how much information is there? Are they just saying who they are or that they are there? Or is there more information about, like, it's time to go hunting or something like that? So that's 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 my field. Uh, and that's quite an algorithmic um, endeavor because we need to look at statistical properties of, of these calls and, and correlations between different elements of the call and, and, and so on. So uh, I actually organized an uh, uh, investigative workshop um, a number of years ago uh, on this topic, on the topic of information in, in animal vocalizations. And one of the applicants to take part um, was a man who you might know, uh, Lawrence Doyle at the SETI Institute. And he works at SETI Institute. And his big thing is that if we're ever going to, if we ever receive communication from tech, alien uh, technological civilizations and we want to decode that um the, the best our best bet for getting a handle on how we might decode that is to try and decode the communication of animals um so he said can i come to your to your to your conference and he did and we had a great time and we started talking we started talking about questions that are important questions for zoologists and independently important questions for seti researchers like for instance Here's a sound. Is it a language? How do we know? Right? I mean, we often say birds, animals, they don't have a language. Only humans have a language. But how do we know that? You know, is there some sort of test we can do to see whether birdsong or dolphin whistles are a language? And it's a difficult question. It's not clear that there is such a test. But if there were such a test, it would be a useful one for SETI scientists to have as well when they start receiving signals from, from outer space. So it, it kind of grew out of that, um, that analogy of, is there information in this signal, uh, whether it's a dolphin or whether it's an alien? And you make a very convincing case regarding language that language must benefit first and foremost the sender of the signal. Uh, and yet you seem to be very much uh, at the at the cornerstone, you know, of, of what's called METI, not META, um, uh, although if Mark Zuckerberg wants to sponsor your research and mine, uh, we welcome, uh, welcome him with open arms. But um, what is METI? Why is that? Um, you know, allig- I mean, again, this is a zool- one of the world's most eminent zoologist, uh, you know, uh, profession, you know, uh, practiced by folks like Richard Dawkins and other. And you're talking about messaging extraterrestrial intelligences. So talk to talk to our audience about this. And don't be afraid to be you know, super geeky. We have the most erudite tech savvy audience in the known universe. So talk about Medi. What is it? Um, and how could that possibly benefit us, Eric, when there's at least some percent chance, as your fellow countryman and, and, and uh, university colleague uh, Stephen Hawking said, even if it's like a 0.1% chance that they could be male- malevolent, could end our civilization um, uh, and only benefit the few boffins like you and me. So tell us, Eric, what is Medi? Why does it interest a zoologist? And what about the risks? So Medi as a concept is the idea that, that we should be sending messages to extraterrestrial civilization. So we're searching SETI, we're searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, but of course, if everyone is searching and no one is is uh, is sending, then no one's going to hear anything. We could all be standing around and just just not knowing that the universe is full of, of very shy civilizations. Um, so there is a, you know, there's a, there's an argument to be made that maybe we should be sending signals. This is, by the way, a um, an intellectual argument. So no one's actually these days, no one is actually building transmitters to, to send things. But there is a valid question, should we be sending messages? And as you say, there are people um, who say, no, this is too big a risk. Uh, we should keep our heads down and, and, and not let the aliens know that we're around because they might come and eat us. So um, I think it's very worthwhile to debunk that idea. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, I think it's a bad idea. I, I, th I think it's, it's, uh, it's not a sound argument. Uh, it's not a sound argument primarily because we've been broadcasting radio signals into space for 100 years now. And, and anyone who has anything like the technology to come and, and eat us um, already knows that we're here. Um, so, it, so I think it's spacious uh, from the beginning in, in that respect. Um, but also, I, I think it's unreasonable and backward-looking to think that aliens are going to come and eat us. Again, it, it, it brings us back to, our, to, to that period between the 1920s and the 1980s when, when it was the Cold War that was, that was the concern. We were worried about being invaded. Um, now, as a physicist, you know that any technology that's capable of transporting uh, life forms from one star system to another must be so advanced, so far ahead of us, uh, that not only um, will they already know that we're here, if they have the kind of energy resources to travel between the stars, they don't need to eat a few humans, okay? I mean, they really, it, it, it just seems like a projection of our own, our own earthbound imperialism that, that we are, uh, are afraid of being invaded. So, so I think it's, I think on both of those counts, I think it's a weak argument that we shouldn't be sending messages. But the reason that I, that I think it's an important argument to have is because we need to change the way that we think about what life in the universe must be like. If we continue to think that it's all about invading aliens who, who are coming to who are coming to destroy us, then then that will tarnish our scientific effort. It will it will tarnish our, our attempts to understand what alien life might be like. And 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 I think we, we, it's important to put things on a on a more solid footing. They're not coming to eat us. Uh, pertinent to your you know, comment that we've been sending out information for 75 years or whatever. The, did you ever hear the joke about these archaeologists in the Middle East and they discover different things? And I'll, I'll tell it just in case my audience hasn't heard it. Um, you know, I'm a purveyor of a relentless purveyor of dad jokes, but this isn't quite a dad joke. But anyway, three archaeologists are in uh, sharing their exploits. One from Jordan comes up, he pulls out this big uh, you know, piece of copper, like in a cable, and he goes, look, this proves Jordanian scientists invented you know, underground wireless conduction of communication in Morse code. Uh, this is evident, clear evidence of this thousands of years ago in Amman, Jordan. Then an Egyptian archaeologist, she gets up and says, no, 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 we found this funnel, and it dates back you know, a thousand years earlier and uh, and it's evidence that we invented in Egypt, um, you know, communication using antennas because it's kind of like an antenna. Um, and then the Israeli archaeologist gets up and says, "We found this," and they're like, "What, what did you find?" He says, oh, "It's nothing." Yes, exactly. We invented wireless communication. So um, <laughs> uh, it's kind of a joke, but yeah, I mean, we have been sending out information, but it's, you know, it's kind of a in, you know, monopolar distribution, very low, um, you know, targeting, you know, messaging the specific star systems. And, and we have sent out messages, the Pioneer disc, you know, which had the recordings of the brainwaves of past guest Andrurian uh, on the podcast. She's been on the podcast before. She recorded her brainwaves, sent it out into the universe. Yeah, the likelihood of that being found is pretty, is pretty low, too. Um, but, you know, this, this notion that of, of pure benefit, um, is, it, is it true? And I've always wondered about this, you know, in terms of like things that are done frivolously, um, besides the, you know, rock musicians that seem to be pretty, um, pretty adept at, 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 you know, mate selection uh, or whatever you may say, I want to keep it G rated here. Uh, but, um, you know, what is the purpose of music? I mean, it is, is sort of, you know, expending a lot of energy, a lot of effort um, as a form of communication. It's very low bandwidth. You know, if you have to listen to a whole song to find out how this guy, his uh, girlfriend dumped them and he got a new pickup truck, you know, whatever. Uh, wh what is the purpose of current perspective on the evolutionary purpose of music? Well, music is um, is seems to be not restricted to, to humans. Um, we know that. I, I've got a student at the moment, um, Vicky Pham, who's doing her her studies on rhythmic behavior in chimpanzees and how that might 
relate to the evolution of 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 music in in humans you know whether we whether we gain a a direct benefit from from these sort of from, from generating complex rhythms um so so there is uh you know there is, there are analogs of music in 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 animals and birds being the obvious example uh, but you you always have to remember that that when we take a, a, a concept like music or or art um or even or even social concepts like for instance um empathy and and fairness a lot of people talk often about how uh, there are many animals many primates who sh- who have a sense of fairness um uh, you know these are these are behaviors that evolved to provide a benefit for those organisms and and um clearly bird song you know provides a, a benefit for the for the male bird and and it's impressing the female bird or the male the male challenger but they only really become music um when placed in the context of human society so there's something happened something happened when you know half million years ago or, or 100,000 years ago something happened where human society was able to take all of these all of these different behaviors and turn them into cultural phenomena which is something slightly different from 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 what's happening in the animal so so uh, while there are clear parallels and clearly our music is is based and has its origins in in adaptive behaviors that are that are very beneficial for other animals it does seem to be it turns into something different when it comes in 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 into human society uh, that, but that is a complex question <laughs> you know i'm not gonna answer that one i don't know the answer to that one <laughs> uh and uh it kind of you know reminded me uh you know a section of the book um which which comes later, but it's about competition and 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 warfare and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I want to cover that, but um, but it made me think of you know what is the pro- throughout this book the main you know kind of progenitor you know protagonist is is you know evolution via natural selection. But I'm wondering if we can go even deeper um, you know than natural selection because a lot of places start off with natural selection. Once you turn it on, uh, you know the 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 game is afoot, right? Um, but um, but I want to go deeper and actually, well, before, if you'll permit me another joke. Um, so you've heard the question, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So one of my uh, kids told me, you know, she had an idea. Um, you could find out which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And you just order a chicken on Amazon and an egg and you see which comes for that. Okay. That you can use that. Feel free to use that. But I want to ask you this question as, you know, one of the world's em- most eminent uh, zoologists um, and thinkers about these topics. It's not clear to me that, you know, natural selection is really the starting point. It seems like throughout this book, uh, the resonant message to me is that competition, uh, you know, whether it be for resources, you know, or mates, and maybe, you know, you could think kind of blindly in the animal kingdom that, you know, mates are a form of resource. Um, what, what, um, what, which comes first? I mean, is it the recognition, you know, obviously at the, at the macro scale in societies that there's fights for resources. We're witnessing one right now in Ukraine. Right. Uh, but, but tell me, is there a notion that something, you know, is, is a, is a um, proto evolutionary requirement that there be competition? I mean, you can imagine like certain civiliz- you know, structures, maybe only artificial intelligence that wouldn't be competitive. So, um, is there something more primal, more primitive than natural selection, or am I totally off base? Not totally off base, but it's a, and it's an absolutely crucial point. So, natural selection requires three things. So, there are three necessary conditions for for, for, for natural selection to occur. Um, there needs to be some sort of heritable information, so passed on from one from one organism to another. Um, there needs to be variation in the in the characteristics of of those individuals and there needs to be what we call differential fitness some need to do better than others which in the most part comes down to competition you can imagine ways where it may not be competitive but essentially that is competition now these three requirements of system any system um, for natural selection to occur are not just necessary requirements they're also sufficient requirements which means that any system that does happen to have those three properties will undergo natural selection 
whether it's artificial, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's internet memes, you know, whether it's religion, whether it, whatever it is, if it's got those three properties, then it then it will undergo natural selection. So the competition is inherently a part of natural selection. It's not that one came first or, or, or the other came after. It's that if there are organisms which could reproduce more effectively than other organisms, then you see natural selection, then you see natural selection taking place. But the other point about this, when you talk about chickens and eggs and, and what came first and how did it all start and, and, and things like that, is that you know, even the most simple life is unbelievably complex. The, mo the most simple life that we know of is far, far more complex than anything that we could build. And, and we presume that the first entities that, that underwent natural selection were not alive, but they were chemicals. So there was a phase, most likely, when chemical molecules themselves were undergoing natural selection. And that was really where life began, even though it's not alive in, in any sense that, that we would think of it today. But it needed that differential fitness. It needed some molecules to reproduce more reliably and more effectively than other molecules. And only then could natural selection take over and, 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 uh, and begin to, to lead to the, the diversity of life we have now. Mm. No, that's a lovely way to look at it. Uh, and what's, again, I'm sorry to keep, you know, just praising you and, and beating you over the head with this, uh, the, but you are one of the rare authors that do something that I love to do on this channel, which is to debate with love and basically to steel man your opponent's ideas and not shy away and just beat them over the head with straw man uh, and so forth. So one of the things I came away almost convinced to become a Lamarckian, Arik, I'm sorry to tell you that, but you're so, <laughs> you're so convincing uh, about the kind of um, aesthetic appeal of Lamarck's uh, perspective in contrast to Darwin. First, for my uh, listeners that need to buy the book, need to listen to the book, um, uh, can you tell, uh, can you explain a little bit about this um, contrast between these two competing approaches, why Darwin won, and what still appeals to you and now to me, because you made me a convert, uh, a sad to say, uh, about Lamarckianism? So, um Evolution by natural selection is horribly inefficient. It's incredibly inefficient, right? It's all down to which of the which of the babies um, get eaten and which ones don't get eaten, and and you end up having to have a lot of babies and 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 a lot of them get eaten. And it's evolution by natural selection seems to be a a fairly effective way of optimizing uh, various characteristics, but it's by no means efficient. Um, and that uh, raises the question, perhaps there's a more efficient method, or a more efficient uh, algorithm that could outcompete natural selection um, and perhaps would then actually take over as a mechanism of, of, of increasing complexity in, 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 in the, the, the world of, uh, uh, in the living world. And the one that, that people talk about is this idea which you could sort of broadly talk about as Lamarckian, um, but the idea that experiences during your lifetime can be transmitted to your offspring. So if um, I, as a, uh, as a mother antelope, uh, recognize that a, a lion is coming to get me and I run away and I escape from the lion, it would be much more efficient for my babies to know that when they were born. Um, classic way that natural selection works is my babies are born. They don't know about, about lions or not about lions and, and half of them get eaten. Um, but surely it's much better if they would know from the fact that I escaped from a lion, um, that they should run away from lions as well. And that idea that the experiences you go through in your lifetime can be passed on to your offspring, um, should in theory, perhaps, uh, lead to faster evolution. But it doesn't seem to, to occur in the natural world. We don't see it. Now, is that because we only have one example of life and perhaps there are planets out there and, and, and some of them have Darwinian evolution and some of them have Lamarckian evolution? Or is there a reason why on Earth we don't see this kind of, um, this kind of phenomenon? And we don't know. <laughs> we don't know the answer to that. Uh, we can do a lot of mathematical simulations, which we do, um, and they kind of give us a clue that it may be that Lamarckian uh, evolution is somewhat um, capricious, 
and it may be a little bit less stable because if you're always changing, you know, your offspring are always um, uh, taking the latest fad, the latest fashion, um, then they may in the long run uh, be, be at a disadvantage. Um, and we don't know the answer, but, but it ties in really nicely to the one place where we know that Lamarckian uh, evolution does occur, and that's in human culture. So we, kn- we can pass our life experiences on to our offspring. We do it every day. Uh, we do it by, by reading them bedtime stories and, we, and, and uh, sending them to school. So, so there's a good example of um, lifetime experiences being passed on to your offspring. And look at the pace of progress of human society. It's been phenomenal. It's been exceptional. Of course, it, it may also end in the extinction of mankind. And I, and I, I think that is a really nice illustration of how just because something may be more efficient uh, doesn't actually make it necessarily more effective. Um, and that, that could be, in fact, a disadvantage of, of Lamarckianism. Or it could be more, you know, too efficient by half or something and, and, and therefore lead to, you know, this notion of this great filter. I, I, I wonder, are you familiar with that concept, the great filter? And, and what's your perspective? Uh, first, again, for my audience that might not be familiar, uh, what is the great filter? And then what might the implications be if we are past it, through it, in the middle of it? Yeah, well, the, the, this harks back to the question of why haven't we heard anything from any any aliens? I mean, surely, if there are alien civilizations out there and they really are as advanced as they might be, then they'd be everywhere. You know, you'd see the spaceships flying through the sky all the time, and 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 they'd be visiting us uh, all the time, openly, not not uh, not just in in you know the backwaters of some. Um, some farmland somewhere uh, but we don't see that so so the question is why not and there are many possible answers there are m- many uh, answers uh, explanations have been proposed one is that um, yes there's life all over the universe uh, yes there's complex life all over the universe but as soon as complex life becomes um, technologically advanced it destroys itself um, and uh, although we don't have any examples except for for one, it's certainly looking pretty much that way. I mean, we're not doing a good job uh, of ensuring the, the the future of humanity. And if that is the case, that that technological advancement just comes so quickly that, that uh, a civilization is not ready for it and not prepared to deal with the problems, and then they may just drive themselves extinct. Um, is that likely? I would say it's one of the better explanations for why we don't see um, many alien civilizations. I, I think it, it certainly is. Is um, the answer to the Fermi Fermi paradox? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, so, so it's 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 quite compelling. Um, however, there is also the argument that if you do manage to get through this great filter, so if you if we were somehow to stop our uh, climate change and to and to stop war and to and to and to solve all the problems of of, of humanity, then essentially you become unlimited uh, in your in your lifespan. You know, you could a civilization like that could exist for billions of years. Um, so it doesn't really solve the, the the Fermi paradox in that sense because surely there'd be one or two that managed to get through the Great Filter, uh, and then where are they? Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is a uh, an intellectual question without a great deal of data uh, on which to base it. I'm afraid. And as an outsider um, for the field of astrophysics, we're going to pivot to next. Uh, and I'm sorry, I wasn't showing my galaxy before. Can you see the galaxy now, Eric? Okay, that's the whirlpool galaxy. Uh, I was uh, I'm too too clever again by half because I have two cameras and I probably only need half of one camera. But um, the Drake equation, it kind of uh, lays out an astronomical terms, a framework by which one could predict the number of uh, intelligent species that could in- inhabit the, the galaxy. And some have even extended it further. My large problem with it is that um, it's, it's something that my students do all the time, which is that they they quote a number, you know, Newton's uh, gravitational constant, uh, you know, and they'll get the number right, the average, the mean value correct, but they won't do any error analysis. So it's like me saying, you know, your dog, you know, Darwin weighs less than 10,000 kilograms. Well, okay, it's, it's, it's accurate. It's not precise. Um, so the problem I have is that there's uh, very little attention paid to the estimation of errors. And we did hear from uh, of my friend Christopher Consolis, who's a professor in the UK, 
a very powerful professor because he actually is the editor for App J, it's just the main journal, or, or was. Uh, and my anyway, he's a he's a friend. Um, but you know, he did a prediction and he came up with this number of you know there are thirty six civilizations in the universe in the galaxy, and everyone's like, why couldn't you add six more? So it could be forty two. Uh, but uh, but the point being, you know, he had to assign some likelihood to that, and, and it was a well done presentation, controversial too. But as an outsider, how do you look at that? Is there a um, zoologist? Drake equation, we can make the Kirschenbaum equation, you know, name it after you, maybe. Uh, here's your opportunity. Well, no, I agree with you. I agree with you entirely about, about the Drake equation. But to be fair, people do um, do attempt to, to address those. So a colleague of mine, for instance, is, uh, uses probability distributions instead of values. So in, rather than saying, you know, there are this many um, planets, uh, habitable planets in the galaxy, say, there's a distribution when, with the mean and, and a certain and a certain variance. So, so you can you can do that, but but really, I don't think the Drake equation was ever intended to give a number. <laughs> you know, it was only ever a, a, an illustration of um, of how there there, there are these multiple uh, multiple constraints on 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 the evolution of life. Um, is there an equivalent? Is there a zoological equivalent? Um, I think that the other, to answer that, I'd say the other problem with the Drake equation is that it has a single output, uh, number of number of civilizations. Um, whereas, if we're looking at extraterrestrial life, there's going to be a diversity of extra. Whatever happens, there's going to be a diversity of extraterrestrial life. I mean, assuming there's any, if there's not none. There will be a diversity. So, much more interesting than how many. Uh, inhabited planets there are is what's the diversity of different types of life in 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 the galaxy or in the in the universe so if there were a zoological drake equation uh, it would tell it wouldn't have a single output how many it would it would tell you more about um the different how many different kinds of um niches might be might be exploited you know are there are there um are really is all life pretty much the same um, or is it is it so diverse in the in the kinds of uh, kinds of habitats that it that it that it inhabits that it that it must be very different? You know, is, are there a lot of people have have um, have speculated without really very good basis that DNA may be a, a universal a universal molecule of heritable information? Is that true? Are there hundreds of different kinds of molecules of, of heritable information. That's really the sort of thing I think that, that I would be more interested in rather than just, rather than just counting. Mm. Very good. Um, so I want to pivot to astronomical topics. So there's a fair number of my uh, audience members who are astronomically inclined. Um, some of my best friends are astronomers. Um, so I want to first ask a, a question. You, you brought up uh, Sir Fred Hoyle. Uh, who's really a hero to, to many of us in the field of astronomy, controversial figure, as you know. Um, and I actually had on, you might be interested to know, Jayant Narlikar, who was his PhD student at, uh, at Cambridge uh, many years ago. But, uh, you know, Sir Fred, sadly, is, is no longer with us. But, uh, but Jayant very much is in, in Pune, India. And I talked to him and his, his wonderful wife. Is a mathematician, and we talked a lot about you know these theories that don't really um, ever go out of favor. And one of them is the steady state theory that he was an exponent of, and still is, despite all the evidence you know uh, supporting at least some version of an event uh, creation or initiation event um, when the universe was much different than it is now. Um, and they keep adding on, you know, sort of epicycles in some ways. But there's many reasons and there are many alternatives to the singularity-based driven narrative of the Big Bang by eminent, you know, cosmologists such as past guest uh, Sir Roger Penrose uh, on the show. And I want to ask you, um, one of Fred Hoyle's, you know, signature lines, he, has, he was a master of the, of the mot juste, of the bon mot. Uh, and one of his ideas was this idea of panspermia, which is one of these things that sounds – Sounds uh, X-rated, but it's, it's really not. Um, and I want to ask you first to define panspermia, uh, what it really means. And correct me if I'm wrong, that he was either the, uh, the coiner of that term or at least a, an exponent of it. Uh, and then I want to pivot to from that to why I think it provides some ev you know, an Abasian confidence interval perspective, evidence against the existence of life in the universe other than Earth. But let's start with that. Panspermia, did Hoyle create that? What does it mean, and, and um, what is its relevance in, in the current context? 
well, it, it, at, at the moment, it's it's a it's an interesting topic that people do take take seriously. Not in exactly the way that 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 Fred Hoyle formulated it, which was quite um, outlandish, I would say. Um, but the idea that uh, in some way uh, life is transferred between between celestial bodies, I think there's very little doubt about that. You know, um, simulation. I, read the paper the simulations that the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs right ejected so much uh, material from earth um that some of it will have landed on the moons of jupiter and saturn already and if microbes could have survived that 60 million year journey then we may get there and find there's there's earth life on 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 these these planets it, it's it's very reasonable and in that sense in in terms of of um life spreading between celestial bodies in a single solar system um I think it's I think it's a plausible it's a plausible hypothesis. Of course, it doesn't answer any questions about the origin of life. It doesn't answer any questions about how life arose. It's just kicking the can down the road a little bit. Um, more problematic, of course, is the question of of directed panspermia, which is the intentional seeding of planets with with life. Which presupposes a technological civilization that is capable of 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 sending uh, of sending biological material between between solar systems and and um, although I do you know play about with that idea in the book a little bit because there are some interesting um, some very interesting questions that 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 it that it that it, um, it raises um, but I think if if that were the case then then you know we're talking about a post filter civilization so where are they why aren't, why aren't they here so yeah i mean pertinent to that i've um i've gone to chicxulub i've uh taken my submersible vessel down uh some 20 kilometers uh, no i haven't done that but but here's a chunk of a fragment i actually have a chunk of um of the planet mars uh which i got delivered um, via the united postal service here in america but um you can buy them you can buy fragments you know a gram or two uh, which is uh, more than I have, but um, but then you're touching like a piece of another planet, and it's it's known to have the same chemical composition. The crustal analysis, my geology friends tell me, it's identical. Um, so again, to push back, like if I told you that there, there is this process um, of interchange of material, and we exchange material with with as you said, you know, definitely some material is ejected into space from Chicxulub and from the you know, the TK event and the cre end of the Cretaceous or Jurassic period. Um, but, um, but why wouldn't that be perceived as, as an evidence against the ubiquity of life in that we, you know, it's, it's, it's had way more than 65 million years. I mean, this has been happening. The early bombardment, heavy bombardment was, you know, a, maybe a billion years after the formation of our solar system uh, or so I forget. And um, it was, you know, it was happening for, therefore, four to five billion years, four billion years. And so why wouldn't there be, you know, tremendous colonies of, of and, and it was co-timed with the stromatolite, you know, existence and, and, and that we've seen and bacteria and the oxygenation events. So why not say that the fact that you haven't seen life on other planets or Enceladus or Titan or, you know, uh, admittedly, not that we have to go and dig it up, but we haven't seen any byproducts of it. So it's, we don't have to go there. And that's like the, the key feature behind what JWST is going to do. It's not going to fly to Proxima Centauri B. It's going to look at its atmosphere. So would you view that as a strike in the Bayesian confidence interval sense or would you say it just rules out panspermia as a viable opportunity either op either option i think is is interesting right yeah but i don't think it's either of them i think it's something else um i i think that in fact that 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 if you look at the evidence that that we've got we can't make that we can't make that um that judgment because mars and venus probably at some point in their in their past were hospitable to earth-like life and for all we know there may well have been um, stromatolites and, and and other earth originating organisms on those planets, but we know now that neither of those planets are hospitable to the kind of life that evolved on Earth. In terms of Enceladus and and, and Europa, we haven't actually looked. You know, we ha we haven't we haven't really looked properly. There are missions planned, and and we do need to. And um, in that case, we may well find we we may well find. Um, you know, there, there there will be there will be systems. Um, Trappist, for instance probably has more than one Earth-like planet in it. 
Uh, and in a case like that, you could ask questions about, uh, okay, what's, is, is life being transferred between the two of them? But it's not really fair to ask that about our solar system when the other bodies in the solar system are pretty miserable places to be. Mm-hmm. So another topic, you know, uh, pertinent to my astronomical audience is that um, the composition of these creatures, you know, some say, and you talk about, you know, the the uh, laryngeal nerve of the of the giraffe versus the the fish, and you talk about calcium in the teeth of all these, you know, predators uh, on Earth. Those fundamentally trace their composition to a type two supernova that detonated in the corner of our galaxy that we call home. Um, and, you know, but another planet, you know, Trappist system, it may not have been formed, you know, identically. I mean, we know its density; it's it's higher than water and less than lead, or you know, you know, rough things about it. But we don't know how much calcium. You know, is in so if I told you that there's no cal, you know, calcium is a fluke of of you know, sol of our solar system. You know, would that change your prior? Like, is there any astrophysical connection to a biological function that would then be necessary for a social function, which you claim is is crucial to an evolutionary uh, advantage and, and heritability of of the tools that would make aliens persist and travel and, and so forth? Is there any astrophysical link? Like you need calcium, and if you don't have calcium, it's over. You can't have a tongue, or I don't know. I'm kind of making it up, but you wouldn't have prey predator, you know, interactions without teeth in the same way we have on Earth. Any astrophysical implications that we can draw purely from astronomy on society behavior of an alien species? I think there are some. I think that there there are certainly some conclusions that we can draw. I don't think that firstly, I don't think that the the calcium teeth prey, predator prey um, argument works because predators and prey will exist. And they'll eat, the, eat each other, however they manage to, right? You know, they'll gum <laughs> each other or something like that. But and and you know, there were predators long before there were teeth on Earth. So um, so that that's 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 not a problem. Um, I think when it comes to more fundamental um, uh, biochemical processes, then we have to go back and ask the question: Is how how unique, how how essential is our biochemistry? Right. We're, fairly confident that a carbon-based chemistry is probably what's necessary for 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 life just because we don't know any other chemical um we don't know any other way of arranging chemistry so that so that it can produce kind of variety of of uh, of reactions that that we see with with organic chemistry um beyond that you know people talk a lot about water in the goldilocks zone uh, and you know, people often forget, non, non-astronomers forget, what is really, really, really common in the universe. It's not something rare and weird and unique to Earth. But it is the actually, most common element, uh, hydrogen, and the you know, fifth yeah, most common element, oxygen. <laughs> so, but when it comes to, when it comes to other, other elements, you know, I, I mean, I think that all rocky planets are, are going to be the product of, of um, supernova. It's, it's the only way that you're going to get, you know, iron and, and, and heavy elements like that. So, so I uh, you could be right. There may be no calcium in, in Trappist, and again, this is one of the interesting things that we're going to find out from examining the the, the atmospheric chemistry of, of of a lot of these planets. Mm-hmm. But I think everyone I've spoken to, um, all the sort of the, the planetary geophysicists and things like that, you know, we're, we're talking about the sa- talking about the same rules, same same laws of physics, um, and and I, I think things are going to be I think things are going to be pretty similar, which does not, of course, rule out. The possibility of a very different chemistry. Um, so, for instance, you, you know, on on Earth, um, there are there are well, nitrogen is is extremely important in in carbon chemistry. Must it be nitrogen that's important in the in the chemistry of, of life on other planets? I don't know. Um, people are looking at other possible chemical pathways, but but um, but yeah, again, amino acids, uh, although they sound really cool and really indicative of life but they're really common right you know there are amino yeah. acids everywhere <laughs> they're not difficult things to make so it seems right. reasonable that life might be based on them yeah our chemistry department here is named yuri hall after the famous harold yuri who with his student St- uh, stanley miller did the famous miller yuri experiment which to my knowledge hasn't really been really functionally improved upon i mean it's known not to represent the earlier of chemistry and the reducing atmosphere versus oxidizing atmosphere. But moving beyond that, um, uh, speaking of, you know, this book is is particularly delightful for, you know, kind of just things you throw in there. And we're talking about our Kirschenbaum's wonderful, the zoologist guide to the galaxy. Uh, and uh, every now and then you'll just, uh, you know, 
did he just mention the Brady Bunch? Uh, yeah. But uh, I assume you're familiar with the Simpsons cartoon. And, and the, there's a famous episode where, you know, like Grandpa Simpson tells Homer Simpson, if you ever go back in time, never step on anything. And Homer starts daydreaming and he goes back and he steps on a bug. You die now, bug. You go squish. And, uh, and then all of, all of history has changed. But, you know, maybe taking a more serious role on it. I always say, you know, it took whales to have Wi-Fi. In other words, uh, like solar panels aren't built with solar panels. You know, the first operating system was written without an operating system. Um, you know, the first computer was designed without a computer. <laughs> it's the nature of these of these initial systems that make them so powerful, but also so random and unique. Um, you know, we 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 had this, you know, kind of abundance of, of carbon life form that made petroleum and, and coal and all sorts of things um, possible. And then those were then used to power the next generation and the next generation after that, ion drives and whatever else my colleagues will come up, warp drive. Um, so what, to what extent is the actual path history, you know, as, as Feynman might say, or so, you know, like the actual path that we took is that how flexible is it or how resilient is it? If we didn't have whales, you know, we wouldn't have had, you know, we would have had to use something else to have light in the, and oil and, and, and so forth, um, you know, 200 years ago. So how, how crucial is or how resilient is the uh, to perturbations about the tech path that we took to get to where we are and beyond? And that's a, a key question. That's, that's a crucial, a crucial question. The insight that that evolutionary biology can give to that um is is not to answer the question directly which we can't do because we can't recreate uh, the conditions on early earth and run the experiment again and, and and see what happens um because clearly there were there were at the very least there were there were astronomical phenomena that that may or may not have happened you know the meteorite may not have hit um earth and 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 so so things would would turn out differently but the insight that we can get from evolutionary biology is to look at ecosystem complexity. And what we can see is that for the first two billion years of life on Earth, life, life on Earth is only like three and a half billion years old, for the first two and a half billion years, it was slime. It was all slime. These were very, very simple ecosystems. And then you got some simple uh, multicellular organisms. You know, three and a half billion years of life, and, and what we recognize as animals and stuff like that, it's only been around for the last half billion. So, so it, it took a long time for life to get started. But when it did, and starting about 540 million years ago, ecosystems began to become complex. So the relationships between organisms started to get complex, complex food webs, predators, prey, groups, you know, parasites and so on. And what we've seen in the last 540 million years has been a dramatic increase in the complexity of the ecosystem. Particularly a major event was the, was the evolution of flowering plants, and then you get insects that are pollinating the flowers, and, and just life exploding. Life keeps exploding into more and more and more diversity. And it seems to be that complexity of the ecosystem that was the basis for our ancestors to, to, to become, to you know, develop a language and societies and, and, and eventually technology. So, so no, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it's probably inevitable that ecosystem complexity will increase. And if it's inevitable that ecos ecosystem complexity will increase, then probably sooner or later, yes, a technological civilization would arise. Mm. So one, one of the tools I use to illustrate the lacunae in the Drake equation is I imagine saying, well, what if you um, wanted to predict the number of people at the world famous San Diego Zoo uh, here in beautiful San Diego, which is normally not downpour drizzling, but normally resplendent in sunlight. So I encourage people to visit. Uh, but I say, if you want to predict, you know, how many people are there, you can make a kind of a Drake equation. And I did it once when I was at the SETI Institute in front of Frank Drake, uh, you know, kind of hostile territory. And I, I came up with a number and it, you know, but I, I did it without error analysis and the error bars then come out to be plus or minus something like two times the number I estimate, <laughs> you know, you could have negative 8,000 people or whatever. Um, and I was just at the uh, San Diego Zoo recently, and uh, I took my daughter there, and we saw this kopji, you know, which is like this on the African savanna. They have these giant rocks, and then, uh, you know, all these different types of animals, pretty wild diversity of animals come there. 
and uh, and they gather around, and they're not really sure what it is. I mean, I, you probably are. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but do you think there's sort of a cosmic cop G? You know, where where if life does exist, that that we'll get together and kind of hang out and 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 talk about what we've learned, or, or do you do you feel more you know less sanguine, shall we say, about the prospects for you know such a thing to exist? I've got to be. I've got to be optimistic that that again, coming back to the Great Filter, that any civilization that can get through the Great Filter, um, what are they here for, right? What do they want to do? Okay, we got through the Great Filter. We solved the. the, the we fixed climate change, we, renewable energy, and there are no more wars, and there's no more poverty, and 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 now what do we do? Well, in the Star Trek universe, of course, we go out and explore, and and we explore in peace, and 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 so on. Because what else would you do? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's it's that essentially, or in another um, science fiction trope, upload your consciousness to a computer and 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 live in this sort of artificial artificial paradise, which which I actually think is extremely unlikely uh, to be something that 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 would happen, if only because the people who would have to build this computer into which you upload your your consciousness are scientists, and scientists is never going to be satisfied with the simulation because it tells them absolutely nothing about the real world. So scientists are still going to want to go out there and, and, and explore. And, and if we can get past any civilization that can get past this great filter, yes, I think, I think that would be, it would be, a, it would be a tremendous um, drive to create a United Federation of Planets. So you talk uh, a bit in the book about um, the differences in you know what was called by Carl Sagan kind of the universal language of math, um, and you and you kind of um, differ with Carl um, uh, about that, and that's 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 great. And I'll leave it to the readers to to read it. But um, uh, there's one notion that you know I was kind of interested to get your your thoughts about, which is that what if the aliens had access to higher dimensions? Um, and, you know, we, we, you know, we don't, we believe we're superior to any kind of flatland creature, you know, that exists in lower dimensions, but if there are truly higher dimensions and they're large, or they could be accessed as, as past guests on the show, like, uh, Jim Gates and, and Michio Kaku and others have suggested, um, you know, is the lack of evidence for such creatures here? I mean, assuming we could notice them and you've got to go through a nice example of how you might notice an alien in a higher dimension coming here, but, um, but the fact that we don't see such things, could that be used in a Bayesian sense again to kind of falsify the existence of both, you know, uh, well, I'll just say not of both higher dimensions and higher dimensional aliens. I'll just say higher dim- aliens that have access to mathematical structures that we don't have access to. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm a zoologist. I don't, I can't tell you what's the probability that there are accessible higher dimensions. Um, I, I, I don't know, but I do know that our, Laws of physics, as we understand them, seem to be fairly complete. Uh, we don't have we, we, we don't understand them to the end, of course, but um, but they do seem to be very consistent. So so from a Bayesian perspective, there seems to be little prior reason to think that these higher dimensions might exist. Of course, you may have theoretical reasons to to think that, and and and, and I can't argue that one. I can't argue that one with you. Um, but one one thing that I think is a is a real lesson from thinking about the mechanisms by which alien life could evolve is that, you know, I do not doubt that there will be some really weird stuff out there. I do not doubt that there will be somewhere in the galaxy, uh, life forms that completely contradict what I say in my book. I, I, I don't doubt that at all, but I think they'll be really rare because the obvious is common. The easy is common. Um, and, and no matter how strange and wonderful and weird aliens might be like, they'll be the rare ones and life that evolves in the ordinary way, uh, in the easy way, in the way that we, that we understand. And, and we understand that natural selection is, is a powerful force. Um, you, you know, that, that, that's going to be widespread. Mm. Very good. Uh, okay, Eric. Well, we've reached now the stand, uh, the point in the conversation where I'd like to ask you audience questions, if you're willing to take some of them. Um, so first question is a comment from John Holly, and he says, I read this book. It was really cool and insightful. There we go. Uh, thanks for that, John. Uh, the first question comes from Gabe Cruz. It's a little bit long, but we can kind of uh, digest it. 
He says, differences between human and other large mammal brains are largely due to divergent evolution of brain structure from a relatively recent common ancestor. This means we share common brain hardware informed by common sensory function. Um, we use our sensory capability to gather information from the same world. It appears to me that mammalian co software cognition differs more in, de in, in degree, more in kind, although obvious differences are still observed in methods. I want, I'd be fascinated to hear a discussion about the impending inter-mammalian translation of electrical molecular brain activity. How would humans react if other species are translated? Um, basically, if we could read the, you know, Dr. Doolittle out, um, you know, our do your dog Darwin over there, uh, would you do it? What would be the implications? What would be the first question you would ask him? So it's true. Mammalian brains share a relatively recent, well, not that recent, but uh, certainly, certainly, um, there's, there are a lot of uh, mammals out there with 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 brains that share a relatively recent common ancestor. Um, brains are, are ubiquitous. All animals have brains because all animals need to translate the sensory information into mostly into, into decisions and into motor movements. Um, but brains are really, really, really expensive organs. They use an awful lot of energy. They're easily damaged. Um, and so no animal has a brain more complex than it needs. And that means that all of these mammal brains, which may look very similar to us in terms of hardware, but their software is there to perform the tasks they need to perform, not to perform the tasks we need to perform. So if you think about, um, if you think about dogs or dolphins or anything else, you know, they've got a brain that they need and it, and it performs the tasks that they need. And specifically, one of the tasks it doesn't perform or so we believe uh, until we prove otherwise is language so we as um, very complex social primates need language it's absolutely essential in our in our evolutionary past when we lived in in large groups of of, of competing um, competing hominins that we had this way of communicating way of passing information way of understanding each other and animals that don't live in those groups don't need that so even if it's built upon the same hardware, they don't have the software. It's just not necessary. So it's unreasonable to think that you could invent a machine that would read a dog's brain and make it something that we could understand. This is the famous Wittgenstein quote, right? If a lion could talk, we wouldn't understand it. Not because of any, of any limitations, but only because that, that experience that they have isn't translatable. To a human experience, um, so so yes, there are similarities. Of course, they are. We are built. We've got the same four legs. We've got the, the four limbs. We've got the same bilateral symmetry as our ancestors did, but the software is different. Yeah, on that topic, uh, I told David Chalmers I'm working on a pseudonymously uh, a written book um, called "What Is It Like to Be Thomas Nagel by A Period Bat." Uh, staying with the brain uh, philosophy uh, question, a very kind of meandering question by listener, re, uh, viewer, MS. Um, and it has to do with maybe chiral asymmetry, um, but also in the fundamental split between the halves of the brain. And uh, this uh, you know, commenter says it's unknown why we have two halves of the brain. Of course, most why questions aren't really answerable in the domain of physics, you know, without some teleological purpose. But um, what about the, uh, the asymmetry? Is there an asymmetry in the properties, function, um, role of the hemispheres of, of other mammals or other animals even? I think it's, I think, um, although it's not my field, but I'll put my, stick my neck out and say, I think it's fairly clear why we have two hemispheres uh, of the brain, the same reason that we have two eyes and, and you know, we're bilaterally symmetrical. Um, and this is this is a fundamental property of almost all animals um, on Earth, and and I believe on other planets too. It's it's just our ancestors, and we're now going back a very very long way. So we're going right back into into before before we have any fossils, a billion years ago. Um, our ancestors were bilaterally symmetrical because it just provided such a tremendous movement advantage. And once you are you once you have that physical structure. 
then remember, evolution builds on what you've got. It doesn't invent things new. So everything that we've built on top of that since then has inherited that that structure and been been constrained by that structure. So I'm not surprised that that the brain um, that the brain has two has two hemispheres. Are there any interesting uh, sort of spontaneous breaking of symmetry that we see in in biology in the same way as we see, for instance, in chirality of 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 certain molecules? Um, there is, you know, there are events. In, there are evolutionary events that that could have gone one way or the other, and and happen to go one way, right? And 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 then you're stuck with that. Um, mostly, we illustrate that with with really maladaptive things, like, for instance, uh, the laryngeal nerve that the that the that the in the giraffe it has to go all the way down the neck and all the way back up again, just because that it's inherited, um, it, it's inherited what it was was stuck with. But um, but I think none of them none of them really none of them really shape the 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 the, the future of evolution in the same way that that biochemical chirality doesn't or the balance between matter and antimatter doesn't right you know there's, there's no difference with it. We, we we might be made of antimatter living you know in an antimatter universe it's just a name there's, there's more of one kind than there is of the other so that that spontaneous breaking of symmetry oftentimes doesn't actually have have visible effects well, there's an old joke just getting back to the giraffe you know giraffe seems to be you know this this magical creature <laughs> i mean uh you wouldn't really expect uh, such a such an animal to exist and then uh you know it's it's like people that say well what what are like sean carroll like what are all the purposes of all these galaxies in the hubble deep field you know uh why should it be that way and if i were god i wouldn't make it and you know one of my rabbi friends says you know what i would be doing right now if i were god the same thing God's doing right now. You think I know better than God? You know, I think like to say that, oh, well, you know, another giraffe on an exoplanet might not have its laryngeal nerve make a four meter journey. Uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, kind of like discounting the, the effectiveness of the, of the, of the engineering solution that whatever God or nature engineered, but I, I don't want to get too far down that, that particular uh, rabbit hole. Um, I do want to ask uh, just out of cure, are you a vegetarian or uh, what, what fraction of zoologists are vegetarians? I am, and it's 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 quite high. It's it's not not ubiquitous, but uh, but it's pretty high, and um, and yeah, that shouldn't surprise you. <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. And what what fraction of zoologists are uh, theologically inclined or theistically inclined? Shall I say? Um, I think that zoologists and I imagine other scientists as well, but but speaking to to the people I know, tend. Um, not to be combative about subjects like this. So, Except for one in particular, whose well, name runs. Well, yes, in okay, <laughs> and there, there are always um, there are always exceptions. But but um, on the other hand, there are um, a number of theistic uh, of, of quite prominent theists. So the obvious uh, Simon Conway Morris, of course, very, right. very famous. Robert Asher is another member of our department who also is. It. So it's it's um, it's not an uncommon it's not an uncommon position to hold, but. Um, but you know we, we have the we have the advantage that that we are we we are confident with our with our understanding of how life could have evolved so so as as long as a, a religious or a theistic zoologist understands that and they do because otherwise they wouldn't be a zoologist then there's really no threat the, um, no no one's sort of threatening anyone else i suppose if you were a geologist uh, and someone comes say well you know i believe the world was created in 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 6 days you might you might say, but that undermines everything that that, that, that I believe. But uh, as long as a theistic, um, as long as a theistic zoologist understands evolution, then, then there's no real threat. Very good. Okay, back to uh, just two more audience questions, and then we'll close out. Um, so uh, the question: This is kind of a tongue in cheek, maybe, perhaps, or maybe some other body part in cheek. But um, uh, uh, a commenter by the name of LV Gamer Cats. Um, C-A-T-S, uh, which I chose, almost chose for one of my kids' names. Uh, but he or she asks, is the 21-second se law of urinating, uh, is that universal? If, in other words, how might it differ if mammals evolved on a planet with half the gravity of Earth or twice the gravity of Earth, uh, sort of these bodily functions? And maybe just globally speaking, no pun intended, but what would be the implications? Are there physical limitations to the existence of intelligent 
you know, uh, sentient uh, organisms. Uh, in other words, gravity is a thousand times, you know, you're in a, a proto black hole. Is that going to happen? So uh, you'll have to forgive me that I'm not familiar with the 20 second one, 21 second rule of urination. Um, Yeah, but and there are, and there will be, of course. Um, and the, as I talk about in 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 the first part of my book, you know, the physics does constrain. Physics. If you live on a planet with with a very thin atmosphere, you're not going to communicate with sound. Uh, you know, if you live on a planet with an opaque atmosphere, you're not going to communicate with with light. There are some things that are that 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 are clearly dictated by um, by the laws of physics. Gravity is one that, that science fiction authors tend to enjoy playing about with. But, you know, it's, and, and no doubt, there is, you know, there's, there, there's an issue here and, and there's an issue about flight and how, how you might fly and, and what, what might be buoyant and what might not be buoyant. There's all kinds, of, all kinds of interesting questions you could explore, but they're purely speculative until we know the details of, of a planet. But one thing that, that's important to remember, though, is that, is that, if you take these physical uh, conditions to the extreme, the problem is no longer biological, it becomes chemical. So if you were to uh, live on the surface of a, of a white dwarf, something like that, and, and, or uh, live on the surface of a neutron star, a famous science fiction story about um, life on the surface of a neutron star, um, then the question is, what chemical reactions could take place? Would molecules be stable? Um, under those under those conditions, and so I, I think it's I think you, you know physics is very low level, uh, and I think the effects are primarily going to be felt at the low level. To hear Eric's answers to the thrilling three, please subscribe to Brian's mailing list at briankeating.com forward slash list. I hope you enjoyed that episode cruising through the galaxy along with the renowned zoologist, Dr. Eric Kirschenbaum. I did, and I know if you loved this video, you're going to enjoy this special playlist, which I've created just for you. It contains some of my greatest hits on the search for extraterrestrial life in the universe, the prospects for fabricating life in the laboratory, and so much more. Please click here for that special playlist I curated just for you. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment in the section below. 